Okay, I think we're a go. Welcome everybody to Archival Adventures episode 56, I think. Uh, it is uh, where we're going to be looking at early 20th century issues of Ladies Home Journal. So uh, welcome in. I am Anthony Wright de Hernandez. I am the Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech. And uh, this is the weekly show where I share materials from our special collections and university archives. <laughs> Hi, Fluid Anne. Hi, Key Squared. Yeah, 56. I'm not 100% certain that it is episode 56. It might be 55. I didn't double check the numbers uh, beforehand, but I know we're right in that range. Um, and I put 56 in the title. Uh, if it's wrong, I'll correct it for the highlight and the, the when it goes over to YouTube, but I'm fairly certain it is 56. Um, <clears throat> before we dive in on looking at um, hundred-year-old issues <laughs> of Lindy's Home Journal, um, <clears throat> I do want to start the stream, as I always do, with the Virginia Tech um, Land and Labor Acknowledgement, so I'm just going to read that now. Uh, Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tudelo and Monacan people's homeland, and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tudelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to ut pro sim, that I may serve, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to, an advance, to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. So, um, <clears throat> so yeah, hi Hannah. Um, today for uh, this stream, I'm trying something that I'm not 100% certain is going to work perfectly, but this is a live program and we'll deal with any problems as they come up. But um, <clears throat> so you'll note, I don't have the pretzel chill piano station in the background today. Uh, the last two weeks, uh, even though I had all the settings set to be completely like Twitch and YouTube safe music, um, the intro was getting muted. So I, uh, try, I'm try. i trying the pretzel guitar station instead. Um, because I like having the music in the background, but I need it to not be muted. Um, and even though I had the settings set to be like completely open and usable music, uh, it was still getting muted. So we're trying this instead. Um, the big experiment though is the materials that I picked for today are significantly larger than anything I have shared on stream before. And my equipment setup is not uh, ideal for sharing of large format items. Um, <clears throat> we've been working on changes. They've been in the pipeline for months now. For more than a semester, we have been trying to get sound paneling up on the walls in here. We've had a green screen on order uh, for an entire semester. Um, we have a, a rack that's supposed to go in the ceiling. <clears throat> to mount cameras on where I could have a top-down actual camera that I could move around and place above what I want to show which would be great for large format items um, none of that has come in even though we have placed orders I uh, have no idea what the lead time is going to be or how much longer it's going to be before we have that and uh, I wanted to share the ladies home journal stuff during March because it is Women's History Month. Uh, so we're going to work with the small um, top-down document camera that I've been using and do our best to make it work. Um, <clears throat> so hopefully, 
hopefully it's okay for you all. Um, <clears throat> also, this room is extraordinarily hot, and uh, that really gets my sinuses going. <clears throat> so, if I'm clearing my throat a little bit, I, I have basically gotten over, I've had a lot of significant like sinus issues going on lately, but today it really is the heat in this room <clears throat> that is aggravating my sinuses and causing me to clear my throat a lot. So, you know, I apologize for all of that up front, but we're going to be looking at Ladies Home Journal. It is a women's magazine uh, that I will pull up and read to you from the Wikipedia here in just a second to give a little bit of background on it, a little bit of history of what the magazine is, um, why it was important, and then we're going to look at issues from you know, the early 20th century um, and just kind of get a sense of what was going on in the um, average middle to upper class white uh, American woman's life uh, during uh, kind of the first 30 years of the 20th century. So that is what we're planning. Hi, Fluidan, thank you for resubscribing. <clears throat> Six months is awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, let me pull up the, um, the thing and... Uh, Ladies Home Journal. Let's go ahead. So uh, for just brief, or for just um, blah, blah, blah. For uh, general history, primer information on Ladies Home Journal, I'm going to the Wikipedia um, to, to learn about it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> We do have a raid coming in from 16-Bit Eric. Um, <clears throat> welcome in, uh, raiders. Welcome in, whimsies, from 16-Bit um, Eric's channel. Um, if you're unfamiliar with me, if it's your first time here, I am, uh, well, you raided into Rogan27's channel. I am Rogan27. I am also Anthony Wright De Hernandez, the community collections archivist at Virginia Tech. And I dual stream to the Virginia Tech University Libraries channel and my own channel. Uh, every Wednesday for a stream where I share materials from the uh, Special Collections and University Archives. Um, this week, be, uh, in honor of <laughs> Women's History Month, um, I am looking at issues of Ladies Home Journal uh, from 1907 to 1929. So early 20th century, we're going to look at some issues of the magazine. I was just getting ready to talk about what um, kind of what is Ladies Home Journal, why is it important, why is it something that we want to look at, and uh, so yeah, welcome in everybody from uh, Eric's channel. Eric, thank you so so much for the raid. Um, let me go ahead and do a shout out. Uh, if anybody was here and does not follow 16-Bit Eric, please uh, give a follow over there. Uh, he is an excellent content creator. I think you'll have a good time. Um, anybody uh, on the VTL Studios channel who might be interested in the TTRPG content that we occasionally do over there, uh, Eric is uh, a very good game master uh, who runs games uh, on, on stream. So <laughs> give a follow over there. Anyway, I'm going to move on to um, actually talk about uh, the content that we're doing today. I'm going to give just a little bit um, and I will tell you, yes, I am a professional archivist, which means I have a degree in librarianship and I understand about citations and sources and I'm going to Wikipedia to read to you some information uh, for the purposes of getting general primer information. If I was doing actual research on the topic of the Ladies Home Journal, I would not want to cite Wikipedia. I would not want to use it as an official source for actual research. But for just general knowledge purposes and wanting to understand a little bit of the history of the magazine, great source. So Ladies Home Journal was an American magazine published by the Meredith Corporation. It was first published on February 16th, 1883, 
and eventually became one of the leading women's magazines of the 20th century in the United States. From 1891, it was published in Philadelphia by Curtis Publishing Company. In 1903, it was the first American magazine to reach 1 million subscribers. In the late 20th century, changing tastes and competition from television caused it to lose circulation. Sales of the magazine ensued... Er, yep, that's what it says. Um, but sales declined. Uh, in 2014, it announced it would stop publishing the magazine as a monthly, with the July issue stating it was transitioning to a special interest publication. Uh, it was then available on a quarterly basis. Um, and then it ceased publication in 2016. Uh, Ladies Home Journal was one of the Seven Sisters, uh, a group of women's service magazines uh, that were basically the big names in, in magazine publishing for the women's audience. So this was one of the seven magazines that had the largest subscribers, or largest number of subscribers and the largest reach among American women. Uh, the time period we're looking at, the audience would primarily have been middle to upper class, white, Christian American women. So know that going in. <laughs> um, but the first issue that I pulled is 1907, which happens to be the oldest one that we have in our library. Uh, and the newest one that I have is 1929. So we're going to look at these, just kind of explore, see what was going on. I will note... Just a, a quick content warning before we dive in. Uh, there are some advertisements in here that use depictions that would be considered racist. So just a note, those may appear on screen because I don't know what pages they're on. I just know that in flipping through, I definitely saw some um, racist illustrations used as advertising in the magazine. Um, so we are looking at historical documents and it is possible that we will encounter some objectionable material. So I'm going to switch to the document cam. Uh, before everybody came over on the raid, I was, I was saying, this is an experiment today. The document camera I am using was not designed for such large format items. Uh, but the technology that we have ordered to allow me to stream larger items has not yet come in. It's been on order for more than a semester. So I'm gonna do my best and we're gonna see how this works. Um, <clears throat> So to start, I've got the oldest issue of Ladies Home Journal that we have in our library. And let's see, you should be able to see the cover page here. And so this is December of 1906, I think going to flip a page here to just confirm. Yes, December 1906. Um, so we get a cover that instead of like a magazine cover, like what we got, like what you'd get for a magazine today. If you went to your local newsstand and you, you were looking for a magazine and you know it's got uh, an image on the front with some headlines to tell you what's inside um, <clears throat> and the title. This is the cover of the Ladies' Home Journal from 1906, December. And on the cover, you have the title, Ladies' Home Journal. Uh, it was apparently published on the 25th of each month preceding the date of issuance by the Curtis Publishing Company. So, um, so this would have been published on November 25th, uh, since it is the December issue. And it starts with the editor's personal page, uh, which is essentially editorials. Opinion stuff right on the front. Um, there's a note, a special word to subscribers here on the cover. 
When you receive notice that your subscription has expired, renew at once using the blank enclosed in your final copy. Sometimes this is a subscriber who has already renewed may receive this blank. That does not mean that the renewal has not been received. We begin to pack in mail bags two weeks or more before mailing and the renewal may have reached us after the copy containing the blank has been packed. In requesting change of address, give us at least three weeks notice. If your subscription expires with this issue, your renewal must reach us before the 10th of January to avoid missing the next issue. We cannot begin subscriptions with back numbers. Subscribers should use postal or express mail money orders in remitting. All rural free delivery carriers can supply postal money orders. <clears throat> so, a very matter of fact, not at all sort of the advertising language that you would get today uh, as a reminder to renew your subscription. Uh, and this, it is a journal. It is a magazine, format-wise, much, much more like a newspaper than we would think of, uh, like, th than what we would think of as a magazine today. Um, so let's look at this editor's personal page. I don't think we'll spend a lot of time on editor's personal pages, but I think it's the first thing on the cover of the first issue that we're looking at. We might as well take a look and see what's there. Suppose we tell you in this more personal way than in an advertisement a little of what we have planned for you in 1907. Of course, it can only be a little, since we have planned so much for the year and there is such a limited space in which to tell it. But here are a few things at any rate. The very popular and beloved Juliet is to be with us again in a fascinating serial. Juliet is indeed magic in her appeal, and now in this new story she will be even more magical, for Mrs. Grace Richmond, her creator, has taken her abroad for the first time, and there she sees new things and runs into a romance that simply delights her feminine soul. And between her new surroundings and a love affair that appeals with wonderful force to her, she really has the time of her life, as she says. And so will her readers, for they have in prospect the best of the Juliet stories. I don't know. That, I, I, it, I know that the Juliet stories are basically a narrative uh, in serial that was in the magazine. I don't know if it ever got published as a novel, as a, a novel of its own. I don't know who the author is. Um, that would be something interesting to look into. Um, Everyone asks, how can we live more economically? How can we save on our, in on our income? Either necessities are higher than ever in price, or our needs are higher. Boy, this one seems to hit home today. Uh, but whichever it is, there is a Mrs. West who has studied this whole question for years. Studied because she had to do for her own household of husband and children on a limited income while her husband had to study it for the United States government. So between the two, they had exceptional opportunities in actual experience and in authoritative investigations, and the entire results will be in these articles. Not the fanciful, but the practical. They actually tell how we can all live more cheaply, and yet just as well, and on small incomes. Foods, clothing, rents, our coal, our fuel, these will be taken up in separate articles, treated thoroughly and yet popularly, and in each case a definite result is reached and a way pointed out. This has never before been done, and that is why this series is exceptional. It actually helps the woman who wants to economize and either doesn't see how she can or doesn't know how. But Mrs. West really shows her. <laughs> so how to stretch your dollar? Uh, that's definitely a topic that, when you look at l the late 20th century, was a common topic for um, women's magazines, uh, how to stretch your dollar. And here we ha have 1907 and an article on how to stretch your dollar. Um, I'm not going to look at all of these, but that... So that's uh, basically a summary of like, what can you expect? Ooh, um, oh, Hannah, thank you for 
<coughs> providing um, the, the Ladies Home Journal from 1884 to 2014 is available on archive.org. Uh, I would love to drop that information in the library's Twitch channel. I cannot reach the keyboard at the moment, so hopefully one of my mods is on and can, uh, can drop that information. Um, I would love to, Hannah. Uh, uh, permit. I do not know if any of my mods are around today. Um, also, I saw there was another comment and I missed it. Grace S. Richmond with Juliet in England. Thank you, Fluidan. Um, <clears throat> so, of course, this being a December issue that we're looking at first, there's a lot of holiday Christmas stuff in it. We have our first advertisement. I'm just going to ask chat, what do you think is being advertised on this page? I'm going to try and grab this link and drop it in here uh, on the other channel. Pub underscore. Ladies hyphen. Maybe. Enter. There we go. Uh, so there is a link to Issues of Ladies Home Journal on archive.org uh, on the library's channel as well there. <clears throat> All right, so we have a couple guesses. Uh, toothpaste, memory aids, something about ivory. Um, oh, I bumped the, yes, it is, it's ivory soap. So I bumped the page. You can see that the elephant has a bar of ivory soap in it's uh, in its trunk there. Ivory soap. It keeps the country clean. Um, there is no exaggeration about this statement. You know, if you have to say there's no exaggeration, it makes me think there might be exaggeration. I don't think it was made with real ivory. Does it say that in the ad? I'm going to read the ad. <clears throat> there is no exaggeration about this statement. It is a fact. Ivory soap does keep the country clean. Nearly every grocer in the United States sells it. Nearly every well-to-do American family uses it. They prefer it to other soaps because it floats. It is pure. It is economical. It is uniform in quality. There is no free uncombined alkali in ivory soap. That is why it will not injure the finest fabric or the most delicate skin. That is why it is equally available for bath, toilet, and fine laundry use. Write for approved methods for home laundering. Contains 68 pages of information that is simply invaluable to the woman who wants to know what to do in order that her laundered things may be as clean and sweet as they ought to be. Illustrated. The Procter & Gamble Company, Cincinnati, Ohio. Hashtag not sponsored. <clears throat> it does not say anything on here about it being made with real ivory was not worth it. If that is indeed the case, I would be very interested in learning that. Um, but also, hello. Welcome. All right, so then we get to the actual, like, title page of the magazine. Um, which I will try to get on screen for you, boy. Which starts with editorials. Um, so this was one dollar and fifty cents for a single, or for a yearly subscription to the magazine. 
So that would have been 12 issues for $1.50. In uh, December of 1906, a single copy was 15 cents. Oh, it was just you being, okay. <laughs> so, okay, that's, that's good. I, I would have been very surprised if it, it was actually made with ivory. Um, so we have some editorials here. And these editorials are from Christmas time, 1906. Um, since this would have been published at the end of November, they would have been from November. But uh, there is something radically wrong when we dread the coming of Christmas. But the lamentable fact confronts us nevertheless that many persons do so. And the saddest part of it is that with each recurring Christmas, the sentiment of dissatisfaction grows deeper and the feeling becomes more and more outspoken. Men have already, for the larger part, reached the point where they frankly say they are glad when the day is over. Women, inherently less blunt, inherently less blunt? Uh, it's an editorial from 1906 confess in larger numbers each year that they feel the increasing burden. Some frankly express their dissatisfaction. Others think it. Interesting. This entire editorial is about growing dissatisfaction with Christmas itself. Uh, quite interesting. I love, it gets to this section over here, and it's very little indeed can be expected from the efforts of parents to bring back the Christmas, uh, the Christian conception of Christmas, so long as our Sunday schools foster the pagan idea of Santa Claus. Wow. This all sounds very familiar to arguments made today, but they are, um, they've, yeah. Definitely uh, conservative arguments that we've heard today. I'm gonna flip through, just looking for things that catch our eye. Uh, I've moved past Christmas. This, this page that we're at right now is um, <clears throat> the cover of the January 1907 issue. Uh, you can see it has been torn and put together with um, cellophane tape here, um, cello tape is like scotch tape, it, it's just a generic term for it, sorry. Camera work today is going to be a challenge just because of the size of the book and the camera I have to work with. Um, so I, I apologize for that. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to... So these, these issues actually were in public, like publicly available for circulation. You could go to our art, our, and our art and architecture library up until last year and actually check out this volume. It was available for checkout uh, in our open publicly available circulating collection up until Last year, when I pulled um, materials for our exhibit on um, the passage of the 14th, Am 14th Amendment, now my brain is insisting that I don't actually know the, name, the number of the amendment, uh, the Women's Suffrage Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, it turned 100 years old, and so I was pulling materials, and some of what I pulled was issues of the Ladies' Home Journal. Um, and I was like, why are these available for checkout? And so we transferred the stuff that was like at least 50 years old or older into the holdings of special collections just because they're in poor condition and they need to be cared for if we want to keep them around. Um, so let's see. So we get um, the suburban whirl, the story of a young couple in the suburbs by Mary Stuart Cutting, author of Little Stories of Married Life, etc., with drawings by Alice Barber Stevens. I think I'm gonna go ahead and read this one just to see what it says. And so we've got, 
This would be a fiction narrative in the magazine, uh, just a story to be read, 1907, January. Chapter One. Oh yes, Hazel Fastnet beamed upon her guests with a pleasant sense of elegance in having pro providentially set the little drawing room in order and put on her long trained lavender gown before they arrived. That was one of the reasons we chose this place, because we knew of so many people here. Of course, just as soon we knew of, uh, just as soon as the baby came, we realized that the only place to live was the country. We thought ourselves very fortunate in getting this house so late in the season. You don't mind the distance from the station? Mrs. Faulkner asked the question with her eye on the carriage and horses outside driving up and down waiting for her. The street was in an outlying part of the suburb. Oh, no, indeed, Hazel's tone was even more animated than usual in the effort to seem oblivious to the heavy rhythmic tread in the room above, where Teresa, having been called from her work for the occasion, was trying to walk the baby into quiet. We don't mind the distance at all. As the agent said, the walk is so beautiful that it really is an additional inducement in the summertime. Of course, it's autumn now, but as I told Ms. Mr. Fastnet, the winter goes so quickly, it's over almost before you know it. If you'd like to see the house now, this is the dining room. She led the way in her trailing lavender dress, the two elaborately gowned visitors who had risen at her word following her precipitate movements with what seemed an air of caution. Mrs. Faulkner, who was the elder and a great lady in the place, had a kind, if preoccupied, expression, while Mrs. Stryker, who lived opposite and had known the previous occupants, was patently taking in all she saw with sharp eyes that gleamed above the diamond stick pins with which her light blue chiffon corsage bristled. Mrs. Stryker's gowns and cloaks and hats were always little short of magnificent. Sables and diamonds were the Christmas presents which she displayed as coming from her husband. Clothes seemed deeply satisfying in themselves. Her raiment was at continual variance with the commonplace appurtenances of her house, and though she went everywhere that she was asked, she never entertained except when the rare exigencies of club life demanded it, keeping, one, keeping but one maid, whom, like the rest of the street, indeed, she was eternally changing. <clears throat> Her husband, who was immersed in the cares of business, was never visible by daylight in winter and was only seen in summer on Sundays when he sat on the front piazza in a high state of cleanliness and shirt collar, his small, thin face, all cheekbones and black mustache, bent over the morning paper with his feet on the veranda railing. <laughs> this is, um, interesting. It is what it purports to be, the story of a young couple in the suburbs, and I'm not certain that it's a story for me, but then again, I'm not a woman living in, like, 1907 United States, so I'm definitely not the target audience. The illustrations are much more interesting to me. <laughs> if you want me to keep reading it, let me know, otherwise I'm going to move on. But, uh, ooh, we have the first article in their practical series of how to live, uh, on a smaller budget. How shall we live? Board, rent, or build? Advice for 1907. Should you dwell in the city, city or the suburbs? When boarding may be cheap but undesirable. Why f flat living comes next to boarding in economy. How much a family ought to pay for rent. When buying a house is, is preferable to renting one. Should you buy a house or should you build one? How a family of moderate means can buy a home. Various ways in which you can save if you build. I love the illustration of the houses at the bottom. It's the house before remodeling 
and the house after remodeling. So let's see, just going off of headlines here, boarding for young couples should only be temporary. Uh-oh. Did we lose the, we lost the camera. All right, sorry about that. Uh, more than two thirds of all inhabitants of greater New York dwell in tenement or apartment homes, the number of which is increasing so much faster than the number of houses that it is almost inevitable that a family of small means keeping house on Manhattan Island must live in a flat. Fortunately, however, we are not all obligated to live in New York. And in any other city in this country, one has a freer choice between flats and houses. Authorities on domestic economy generally agree that a family ought not to spend more than one-fifth of its total income for rent. Unless the rent includes heating, in which case it may be allowable to pay as much as one-fourth of the income for an apartment which has heat and hot water and a good range and refrigerator. I find it interesting just as a matter of linguistics that in this article for an American audience from 1907, they refer to what we would call an apartment today as a flat. I do know that in the UK, it's still called a flat today. But in the U.S., it's an apartment. Uh, but in this article for a U.S. audience from 100 years ago, it was called a flat. I find that interesting. Oh, Key Squared, what are you sighing about? Don't pay more than 20% uh, of your income? You'd love to spend no more than one-fifth of your income on rent? I think the recommendation today is, um, I want to say 10%. No, not 10%. 10% is uh, that you shouldn't have to pay more than 10% of your income on paying back student loans. Uh, as far as housing costs, I would be surprised if it wasn't somewhere around 25 or 30% today as well. But I don't actually know the number. Oh, here's an interesting, an interesting article. Oh, ah, I think we're going to struggle with, I'm, I'm going to have to be creative. We may only see the left hand pages of this, of the magazines, because uh, me moving the camera around is causing it to disconnect. Current recommendation is a third. Yeah, uh, it's just housing costs are up. Honestly, every, every cost is up right now. Um, how an apartment burglar works. As told by a burglar for the protection of families living in flats. There are two or three things that women living in flats should bear in mind where burglars are concerned. The first rule is never to leave a strange collar alone in a room for a single moment. The second is to see that the strange collar always goes ahead of you in leaving a room. If you, w if you will always remember and observe these two simple rules, you need have little fear of apartment burglars. One important thing to know is that the flat worker almost invariably chooses Thursdays for his call, because it is the day out for most servants. He will often go still further and choose even the hour, selecting one when the servants, if at home, will be occupied in the kitchen and when the mistress of the house will not be wearing her jewels but will have left them lying somewhere. Jewel, jewelry is almost always the thing which the apartment burglar tries to secure because he must work while the people in the apartment are around, and so is obliged to take only articles small enough to be carried in his pockets. <laughs> Perils of big city living! I mean, this advice would not work for today because this advice assumes that the woman stays home and runs the household rather than going out and working a job. 
uh, that there are household servants, and therefore going on a Thursday when they're not around is, uh, makes it more likely you can steal things. Interesting. Uh, the advice continues with, he usually knows where women put, put their jewelry, sometimes sentiment influences a burglar. Never leave a stranger alone for an instant. Beware of the man who changes his appointment. Try to remember what your visitor looks like. And one woman who would not be bluffed. Okay, we'll read one woman who would not be bluffed. That, that sounds interesting. I realized in a moment that there was trouble ahead and tried to bluff. But it was of no use. She accused me of taking her jewelry, and when I denied it and told her that I was innocent and would have to go, she slipped her hand into my arm, saying that she was going to stick to me and would take my arm because it was so slippery. We walked into the business section of the city, arguing the matter, and she defeated every effort of mine to elude her. Twice we entered crowded stores, which had two entrances and which were located in the busiest part of town, but I was unable to shake her off. Finally, I proposed that I call that evening and talk the matter over with her and her husband and show that I was entirely innocent, to which she replied, What guarantee have I that you will come? I was wearing two fine diamond rings at the time, one of which I had stolen and the other I had bought. I handed her my own ring as a guarantee that I would be there. The stolen ring might have got her into serious trouble had the officers found it on her, and her intelligence and fixity of purpose had so won my admiration that I had no wish to make her any trouble. She took the ring from me and we separated. It was very cold that night and I wanted to stay at home, but eventually I decided to go and make my peace by returning to her the value of her jewels. A little reflection after I got started, however, showed that it would be safer to arrange the matter by telephone, but I had torn up the card she gave me and the telephone did not stand in her own name. There was nothing to do but let the matter go, so I boarded a car for home and just as I got off I was arrested by a plain clothes man on another charge. The next day, the woman I had intended to see was among those whom I was called upon to face in court. She had not told the police of seeing me, and her appearance there was largely accidental. But just the same, if her husband had remained beside me all the time I was in the house, she would not have lost her jewels in the first place. <laughs> Blaming the victim. Let's see... All right, we have another ad. Do you know what this ad might be for? It's another full page magazine ad. Uh, I'll even read you some of the copy. To wage war successfully, said one of the French kings, three things are necessary. First, money. Second, money. Third, money. With equal truth, it may be said that in order that beautiful things may retain their beauty, first, three things are necessary. First, care. Second, care. And third, care. And the more beautiful they are, the more care they need, and the shabbier they look if they do not receive it. A marble statue, for example, is a positive eyesore if it shows evidence of neglect. So are hardwood floors, silver cut glass, fine furniture, pianos, 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 <laughs> oil paintings, and oriental rugs. Again, 1907. Language has changed somewhat since then. Uh, we would not use that term today. Uh, it is for cleansing just such articles as these that ivory soap is admirably adapted. It is so mild, so pure, so entirely free from free alkali that it can be used to cleanse anything that water will not harm. Cut glass and silver require special treatment but for the majority of articles in and about the house, a thorough going over with ivory soap suds, followed by a rinsing in a clean, cool water, and of course a final polishing with a chamois cloth, is all that is necessary. Try it. Ivory soap. 99 and 44 one hundredths percent pure. Key squared, yes, it was soap again. Ivory soap. 
once more. I have a feeling they were a major sponsor of the Ladies Home Journal at this time. Let's see what we get. All right. <clears throat> we have a couple of ads on this page. I find ads to be one of the most interesting things in old, old publications. We have McLaren's Imperial Cheese over here on the left. Um, our pedigree, care in production of milk and freedom from preservatives give you pure materials. Care in, er, care in maturing cheese and sterilization of containing jars give you scrupuli scrupulous, pardon me, scrupulous cleanliness. McLaren's Imperial Cheese, because Imperial Cheese is prepared with all the regard for cleanliness which could exist in our own kitchen, and because it is a nourishing food, we have warrant for saying, it's as good as it tastes. In 10 cent jars and upwards, McLaren Imperial Cheese Company, Limited, Detroit, Michigan, and Toronto, Canada, cheese salad number three, one half pound English walnuts, stalk of celery, small portion parsley chopped fine, add jar of Imperial Cheese number one size. <laughs> the corn without holes. Add over here. Winor kerneled corn. Oh, sugar corn. I've never heard sweet corn referred to as sugar corn before, but okay. The sweetest, most perfect green sugar corn is selected. The ears are passed through a patented machine process, which opens every kernel on the cob and cleanly separates all the delicious milky meat from the indigestible hulls such as winter kerneled sugar corn, the corn without hulls. You have eaten corn, how annoying the tough hulls are. And because those hulls are absolutely indigestible, dangerous irritation is caused and physicians, re rec physicians recommend only winter kerneled sugar corn, the corn without hulls. As a vegetable, it is an Epicurean, Epicurean revelation and for puddings, fritters, and soups, there is nothing else like it. If your grocer hasn't it, it is really worth your while to send us his name on a postal card. Just try a can. Winor cream salad dressing, a smooth combination of the purest ingredients, tempting in the dish and a marvel to plate. Packed only in Pressing and Ore, a company, Norwalk, Ohio. No pure food laws were needed to make our products pure. Interesting. Right, uh, so we've spent a lot of time in 1907 so far. Um, I don't particularly know of anything event-wise that stands out to me about 1907 that I should necessarily look for in this magazine. <clears throat> I think I'm gonna move on from 1907. The next one I have is 1915. And if my brain is accurate in its date processing, 1915 should be during World War I. It's still an enormous book. Is very large. Um, <clears throat> so these are bound copies of the magazines. Um, they're bound together into what is essentially one large book. This is the same thing that we do with newspapers. The magazine actually does get smaller over time, and so if I manage to get to the 1929 issues, they're significantly smaller. <clears throat> but here we have volume 32, January through December of 1915. You can see it's, it's gotten some wear to it. 
Uh, let's just flip to somewhere in here and see. We've got color. There's color. What is this egg test about? <clears throat> I'm, I'm very curious now why they have the pictures of the eggs. How you can, oh, it's how you can tell a fresh egg. Just hold an egg before a candle, gas, or electric light. If it looks like this, it is perfectly fresh. If it shows the red spot, it is slightly stale. If it looks settled at the bottom, like this, it's stale. Interesting, the, um, so you know how an egg shape is narrower at one end and wider at the other? They refer to the narrow end as the bottom which is not how I would have conceived of an egg. If it looks like this, it means the yolk is adhering to the shell. It is stale. Uh, and then next down, if it shows this blood ring, it is stale. And if it is cracked and red, or with this black mold, it is stale and bad. <laughs> These egg tests are absolutely authoritative, having been made by the Bureau of Chemistry of the United States Department of Agriculture at Washington, through whose courtesy this reproduction is made. All right, 1915. How to know if your egg is fresh. And honestly, this test would give you some sort of information today, too. A fresh egg would be pretty clear looking, and then you can tell if the egg has gotten stale. Just hold it up to a light. Let's see what we can find. I'm looking particularly, this is 1915, so I'm looking to see if there's going to be any mention of the war. We have another ad. I bet you can't guess what it's for. If you guessed ivory soap, you'd be right. Just really, I'm just flipping through right now looking to see if anything pops out about World War II, or World War I. Ah, I do believe I have maybe found something about World War I in the magazine. <clears throat> uh, pardon me doing camera moving. I'm really sorry about all the camera moving. Wish I had a better way to show you large format items. We are working on it. Does anybody, did that say, does anybody want a little boy? Uh. I don't know what page we were on. but I'm willing to go back and see if I can find it. New blouses and accessories. 
Victor Records. Were there images with it, Hannah? Oh, it would have been on the right-hand side upper corner. Oh, I found it. <laughs> and, and actually it's here as well. Anybody want this little boy? Continued from page 57. Let me start at page 57 and we'll, we'll find out what, what this is all about. So one of the big differences between the previous issue we were looking at from 1907 and this issue, uh, in 1907, the stories like this, oh, it's continued from page 16. We'll jump back to page 16. Uh, but in 1907, the stories took up whole pages. And now we've got ads uh, with the story in this narrow channel in the middle between the ads. Sorry, let me go to, to page 16. I'm going to find the root of this story here. <laughs> Got some music. Page 16. What? Continued from page 16. What? On page 37. This does not make sense. Oh, did I go too far? I think I went too far. I don't know. Ten. Yes, I did. I went into page 16 of a different issue. Maybe? 34, 30, 27, 24. I'm going to find it. I swear. I know how books work. Page 18. Page 16. Anybody want this little boy? Why he longed something terrible to live with a mother by Marie Conway Omler, author of The Trousseau That Wouldn't Get Ready, etc. Uh, so this, I believe, is one of their fiction stories um, that they have in the book, in, or in the magazine. So not an ad for something, just a, a story. They were illustrators and makers of odd and beautiful advertising and extremely gay young folks, Lester's father and mother. Their friends were as gay as they were, people given to much merry talk and light laughter, to ringing doorbells at unearthly hours, eating supper sometimes in the almost morning. Often Lester had been awakened toward dawn to hear those light-hearted bohemians still merry-making in the dining room. He wished he might be permitted just to peep in and feast his eyes upon them, but he understood very well indeed that he must keep strictly out of sight he adored his father and mother with all his heart but they were so busy loving each other and doing much work and being gay with so many friends that they simply couldn't find time to bother with only lester <laughs> glad it's a story and not an actual advertisement yeah they couldn't even use him for a plain ad much less an illustration or a kitty poster, his little, thin, sensitive face couldn't fit in for bouncing breakfast food youngsters or robust soup and jelly kid kitties. You couldn't put him in rompers or cute little bathing panties and let him scuttle along brook or beach to make an outdoor ad that would lure city folks to take to this or that resort, for his skinny little ribs and his legs and arms like sticks showed up with uncompromising plainness, and his face was of an owl-like gravity, the large eyes serious and questioning. As a matter of fact, they hadn't wanted him at all. They were so sufficient to each other that a third member of the very disagreeable, uh, that a third, I lost it, sorry, that a third member of the 
firm seemed rather an impertinent intruder. So Lester was a very disagreeable surprise. They were inclined to be... S I don't know why it's really hard for me to track. They were inclined to be somewhat blank about him at first. Fortunately, his mama had done some perfectly enchanting baby food ads, so she knew how to feed him before Katie came and after the train and after the trained nurse had gone. After Katie's arrival, the baby wasn't any more trouble, and his mama, with a sense of relief, could get back to her real vocation, that of making advertisements so alluring that money jumped out of the public's pocket of its own accord at the mere sight of them. So it is an entertainment. How can he stop snoring? You've got you've got a husband that snores? I've got advice for you. Some food stuff. Next to an ad for Crisco. I really am trying to look for, like, anything about the war. I lost which page we were on before where, but it, I, it was another fiction story. It just seemed like it was related to World War I. Because it, ooh, we have a lovely Jell-O ad here. Full page color ad for Jell-O. America's most famous dessert. All about the easy Jell-O way, 10 cents. Every housewife who does not already know how to use Jell-O to the best advantage will be glad to get the information supplied below. At the left are some plain Jell-O dishes, and the recipes appear alongside them. These are the famous made-in-a-minute desserts. At the right, opposite each plain dessert, is a more elaborate dish made from the same flavor of Jell-O with a recipe telling how it is made very easily. So... This is April 1915, and we have a full page color ad for Jello. With some lovely Jello molds on the left, and some Jello desserts on the right. So, using strawberry Jello, you can have just strawberry Jello, or you can have the Apple Snow Jello. There's hardly a cookbook in this country that does not contain at least one recipe for apple snow. But never for one that is as good as this one, or one that can be so easily made. Dissolve one package of strawberry jello in one pint of boiling water. When partly cold, turn into sherbet glasses, filling three quarters full. When firm, pile apple snow on top. Apple snow, white of one egg, one grated apple, and one half cup sugar. Beat till light and feathery. Interesting. I wasn't exactly expecting full page ads for Jell-O in 1915, personally. I don't actually know when, Je when Jell-O was invented. All right, I'm going to look and see if I can, I'm just going to skip forward a little bit. We have plenty of magazine to look for. I don't have to be stuck in one magazine. I could, uh, honestly, we could spend the entire two hours looking at one issue, which I don't plan to do, but. Uh, sorry, I have to just adjust that, and there we go. Snoring, children's table, let's get you the top of the pages. Oh dear, how 10 girls had a shower for $1.50. I do believe that that is not referring to a shower with water. I think it is a wedding shower. I'm going to find the cover of the next issue. Yeah, 
In 1845, New York industrialist Peter Cooper patented a method for the manufacture of gelatin, a tasteless, odorless gelling agent made out of animal byproducts. Cooper, pr Cooper's product failed to catch on, but in 1897, Pearl Waite, I know that name, a carpenter turned cough syrup manufacturer in Leroy, a town in upstate New York, was experimenting with gelatin and concocted a fruit-flavored dessert. His wife, May David Waite, dubbed it Jell-O. Thank you, Hannah. See, I, I get these questions when I'm looking at things and I generally don't follow them because if I did, then I would constantly be going down um, <clears throat> distraction byways, and I, I so I can't let myself follow them, or I would never get any work done. Um, which is p honestly part of why I like the stream, because uh, you all can follow them for me, and then I learn things. If you couldn't guess what ad, th what what product the ad here is for, uh. I will just point to the bar of ivory soap in the woman's hand. War nature story of the world conflict. Hey, hey! I don't think we'll read the entire thing, but it's something that references the world war. So it's, this is a fiction narrative. The silence of evening lay upon the whole scene, upon the dull oaks, the duller pines, and the little burnished thickets, and there was nothing alive there except three coal-black crows beating slowly across the valley. Then the wolf came. At least he was there, standing just on the edge of the thicket, motionless, close to the stream. Once he lifted his head and sniffed at the breeze, then, lean, gaunt, and gray, he slouched into the open, down to the stream, and drank. And suddenly, his head was up. There had come no sound, no sight, nor sign. But he knew, and slowly his head sank, his body stiffened, and he began to draw himself together. Presently, among the buttressed tree boles, it was as if stars shone, only for a moment. Then there was a faintly burning gleam, a hint of something light, a ghost of a shadow. And it was gone, and the wolf after it. It was... First the eyes, then the vanishing light rump of a roe deer. The silence of evening still lay upon the oaks and the pines, the deep valley and the polished stream. Not a living thing, it seemed, existed there, but the twigs were still swaying where the wolf had passed, and up above, among those buttressed tree boles, bodies showed and a twig cracked. It was Russian skirmishers advancing cautiously. There was a pause while the men came down to the stream. Then a young officer crept off cautiously downhill along the stream, alone, until finally, on the edge of cover, he pulled out his prism binoculars and searched the op opposite hill across the gorge. He saw the scattered plantation of youth, grown with bushes and bracken between, the dark fir wood and a pigeon flying over it, nothing there. He searched the bare ground above, broken and unshorn, nothing but a galloping wolf there. He scanned most carefully the sharp-cut crest of the hill above that. Nothing save the vanishing hinder half of a, of a roe deer there. Then he crept back to his men, spoke swiftly, and one of them, turning on his knees, signaled back with his extended arms. No enemy in sight. A messenger took the signal and translated it to a field telegraphist, who flashed it to the, to the general at headquarters a mile or so away, the army, it seemed, could advance across the valley with safety. <clears throat> Down the slope slid the wolf on a trail, <clears throat> on the trail of the roe deer. He seemed to take the rough ground, the boulders, the long grass, the deep yawning thickets, the hollows, the low branches, as if it were all a racetrack. Nothing appeared to check him. Nothing could stop him. He just kept on at his easy, loose, leggy wolf slope, head down, tongue lolling, nose glued to the scent of the beast, which, of course, he had long lost sight of, for the roe is the most clever of all deer in the hunt, up to, up to every trick of the trade and as difficult to run down as a will-o'-the-wisp. 
The wolf ran mutely, only making an anxious little whimper, as a dog will hunting a rabbit. Uh, when he... When he was checked where the roe had, had run back on her own trail, or galloped in circles, or flown, jump would be too clumsy a word to use in regard to the fairy roe. From side to side, or leapt over a fallen tree trunk and leapt back again, but if the roe was a past master in playing with her pursuer and in laying the most puzzling trail on earth, the wolf was a past master too in unra unraveling trails, and although brought off into a check, was never actually at fault for more than a few seconds. Interesting. <clears throat> so it is a tale related to World War I, but focusing on a wolf chasing a deer. Frank Howard Atkins, 1882 to 1921, was a British writer. He wrote more than 180 short stories in pulp magazines, most of which were published between 1908 and 1935. Most were published under the pen name F. St. Mars Atkins. Stories under the Mars pseudonym usually revolved around animals. Thank you, Fluid Anne. Then that totally makes sense why we were focused on the wolf. <laughs> Hi, Geek Out. Interesting. So, from what I can tell, there doesn't appear to be like news reporting. There's advertising. There's the latest fashions. There's um, stories for people to read that might relate to current goings on in the world, but as of 1915, we don't have current affairs. We don't have uh, what appears to be like reporting on the goings on of the world. And I note this because I know <clears throat> that as we get into 1920 and women's suffrage, we start to get actual like articles discussing politics and current affairs and things like that um, instead of just stories. You still get the stories, but you also get the politics and current affairs. <clears throat> so here we have January to June 1919 which should put us into the time period of the Spanish flu. Uh, oh, so on the cover page though, we're gonna get a little bit, uh, sorry, I keep wanting to do this a different way and I need to do it this way. If, you, if I'm gonna show you all the page, I have to do it this way. I apologize for the shaky camera. All right. Camera's done shaking for the moment. It won't be the last time. A large number of us have, a large number of us have worked hard during the war and have done good service, but now that the war is over, we want to let down. Back in our hearts, we want to return to where we were before the war and put on our loose, comfortable slippers. Things were all right then, we say. We were prosperous and we were happy. Now why tumble things about? But tumbled about things are going to be for the very good reason that we cannot go back to where we were before the war. The streams of human life do not back up. They flow on and forward. And whether we like it or not, forward we must go, and forward we should go. And what is more, we should like it. And to go a bit farther, we should, we should help, because if each doesn't do his or her part, we shall stumble, and why not walk? We must reckon too on our boys when they come home. A great deal of foolishness has been written as to what we, what we are going to do for them. Some voices talk of material rewards as if they have done, as if what they have done can be paid for. 
And as a matter of fact, when our boys come home, they will quietly re-enter civilian life without half the fuss that we now think there will be. This country of ours has an amazing way of swallowing folks up, of quietly solving what look like tremendous problems. What these boys will do is not to disrupt things in the way they are, uh, in a way, is not to disrupt things in the way they are going to go back into their normal lives. It is rather the effect that these two million boys are going to have on our whole body politic. For their military experience has taught them certain standards of morals, health, and duty that are foreign to the minds of most American communities and they will wonder why some of these community standards cannot be tilted up a bit. It is not so much a question of what we are going to do for our boys as it is what they are going to do with us. Never were two million men so likely to control American affairs as this returning army. They will influence the vote for one thing. They will see at once the difference between the standards of citizenship they have imbibed and the lower and defective citizenry that actually exists in our communities. And they are very likely to be heartily dissatisfied with things as they are. They have learned as never they could, as never they could have, as never they could have learned that good health is possible and can be secured. And that disease is something that should not be cured, but can be prevented. And one of the roads to health and manhood that this army has seen lies in the lesson that morality is a natural obligation and that it pays, if nothing more, to be decent. The closeness and sacrifice of the lives they have lived have taught them that the great fundamental fact of human relations is a regard for other fellows' rights, a brotherhood based on service and sacrifice. Now we ask, in what concrete ways will these experiences and lessons show themselves? Interesting. So, editorial for the beginning of 1919. Looking at all of the hope that a year without war might bring. Ooh, on the right hand page here, we have an ad for a Victrola. I hope that you all are aware of what a Victrola is. Basically, it's uh, a, an early record player. <laughs> yeah, honestly, it's 1919 Smart TV. Victrola 6 came in mahogany or oak. <clears throat> and the Victrola 17? Down here at the bottom, we have the Victrola 17. Which is a tall cabinet. The 6 is the one over here that's um, much smaller. So by 1919, so 1915, there wasn't a lot. Get that mahogany edition. Uh, or got that mahogany edition. Um, 1915, there wasn't a lot of like war-related stuff. We ran across one story, and it was about a wolf. Um, 1919, though, very first story, the fighting father is, and the caption for the image is, "It's dad I go for." because he can't go. I'm his son, his substitute. I must face the music for him. Uh, so, this is definitely a war-related war story. While our boys are marking time, time what our government and the YMCA are doing for them. Uh, Soul of the Shipyards. So yeah, now, uh, 
in 1919. So 1915, I had flipped through and was looking, and all of the narratives in there seemed to be fiction. But we actually have like news or story reporting here in 1919 now. So the war seems to have changed the focus of the Ladies' Home Journal to some factual reporting in addition to the narrative storytelling. Uh, so this one is called The Soul of the Shipyards by Charles M. Schwab. There isn't a woman in all America who should not be concerned with the nation's shipbuilding program, for every rivet that is driven is just another assurance that she and her children are that much more secure from experiencing the terrible fate that thousands of her sisters in France and Belgium and Serbia have, have suffered. That is why I am glad of this opportunity to tell the women of America some of the things that from day to day developed in our job of building ships that to me seem to epitomize the wonderful spirit of loyalty and war-winning to get-togetherness get that pervade the vast yards along our coasts. You women of America have made our jobs easier. In April 1917, when our country was forced to take up arms against the German war makers, American shipbuilding was just awakened, uh, just awakening out of a long 50-year sleep. The less than two score yards we then had were as busy as they could be with Navy work contracts with foreign owners and governments, and with orders from American interests. The nation's mind was on the whole quite unconscious of, the, of, an, of such an industry as shipbuilding. With the passing of our clipper ships past all public interest in seafaring and in ship, shipyard occupations, but Pershing's appeal for a bridge of ships across the Atlantic Ocean was electric in its consequences. The country speedily saw that without ships and many of them, a large part of all our war preparation might prove futile. It began to realize that we could at best throw between our shores and the vital western front only one slender line of communication, exposed night and day to cutting by the menacing German U-boats. But the pathway to democracy lay unmistakably across an unbroken line of ship decks stretching from America to France. With the dawning of this situation in the minds of thinking Americans, America set to work to give Pershing his lifeline of ships. It created a great industry within a 12-month. And what is more, I rejoice to say, it found within this creation a spirit, a soul as potent in spanning the two continents as the tools it was using. So actual like war reporting aimed at women, at a at a at a audience of women. Um, I don't know if that influenced why they have a shirtless man. I mean, I also don't think he should wear a shirt if he's working in 106 heat all day long. Uh, but Definitely not something you typically saw in 1919 was a, a man who had no shirt on whatsoever. Uh, let's see. I, I'm going to flip through a little bit uh, later in 1919 and see if there's any mention of the flu. It's February, March. Whoops, sorry. Also, if you see something while I'm flipping through and you want me to stop and, and look at it, uh, toss something in chat. I can always jump back and we can look and see. Why many of us feel tired and fail to do what we could do. Oh, it's not something about war weariness or anything like that. So, <clears throat> if your plant is drooping, Let's 
see. Oh, America enters Jerusalem. The beautiful story of an American pilgrim who entered the gates of Jerusalem alone, yet who represented the work of mercy of 20 millions of American women to people who did not and cannot yet understand. <laughs> the white road leading northward through the barren hills of Palestine brought to Jerusalem on a blazing July afternoon of last summer one man who entered the holy city alone walking reverently. Far behind him was the low cloud of dust that was the road from Lud. 35 miles across the brown curves of desert land came a string of hurrying cars and loaded motor lorries that were in his charge. But he came into the gates of Jerusalem alone and on foot, a pilgrim from the New World to the birthplace of the world's three great religions. It was the ending of a pilgrimage that had begun in the countless towns and cities of America. Innumerable women in Red Cross workrooms had rolled bandages and made surgical dressings to load these motor lorries. Innumerable children had carried dimes to school in warm little palms and given them to make possible the journey across the ocean over South Africa and Ceylon through the Suez Canal to Port Said and up over the desert behind the British Army into Palestine. The spirit of America was in that pilgrimage, and it was such a spirit and such a pilgrimage as the sorrowful, sorrowful peoples of Jerusalem had never seen and could not understand. Colonel John H. Finley of the American Red Cross, walking into the ancient city on that hot July day, entered a place of swarming alien races. What? And many creeds and languages and the mission on which he came was one incredible to them all yeah so a story of the red cross going to jerusalem to provide aid but it is definitely couched in american exceptionalism alien races uh-huh sure New pies for Easter. Oh, that reminds me, we're gonna do some pie-related stuff for special collections um, come March 14th, since March 14th is pie day. Uh, I believe I am going to be attempting to make a transparent pie, which is not see-through. Uh, it is just the name of the pie. Uh, and I found a recipe for it. And I think there's at least one other pie being done by somebody in the department. And we'll have some photos. They might go out on the library's Instagram. They'll definitely go out on the Special Collections Twitter. Um, I am not equipped at home to be able to film my pie making. Otherwise, I would do that on a regular basis. So sadly, that will not happen this year. <clears throat> Still flipping through, I have not seen any mention of the flu, the H1N1 so-called Spanish flu, uh, of which there was a pandemic in 1919. I say so-called Spanish flu because its origins were not actually in Spain, it's just Spain is the country that actually decided to acknowledge its existence. It's also possible that I would need 1918 issues to actually get stories about it. Nobody wanted to talk about the flu that was spreading because everybody was at war and they didn't want to admit that their soldiers were getting sick. Price of Empire. So there's a lot of war-related stuff. I mean, this, these are definitely war illustrations. Where the temple... Wow. Nope, not reading that title.
Franklin sedan. Right. General Pershing's 100 Heroes. Little portraits of soldiers. Well, let's look at the second half of 1919. <clears throat> See what we can find then. Or we could skip ahead to 1929. How much time do we have? Half an hour. We'll do late 1919 real quick. I do want to look at the end of 1929, beginning of 1930, if we can. If anybody has any idea what might possibly have happened then that I might want to look for. <clears throat> Ooh, 1919 fashion. the most fashionable ladies in 1919. These are her four outdoors outfits. And on the next page we have <clears throat> three evening dresses. The height of fashion. Entire ads, we've got a directory of schools and colleges. Still have the General Pershing's 100 Heroes section <clears throat> with portraits of soldiers. <laughs> Can you guess what this ad is for? Don't ignore the menace of the deadly fly. Somewhere in every city, town, and village, there are disease breeding places, places where you will find filth and dirt, garbage and disease. It is in such places that multitudes of flies breed. And it is from these places that hordes of these disease-laden emissaries of death scatter and enter homes. Your home. Many a fatal illness owes its origin to a hardly noticed fly bite. The menace of the fly is so deadly you must not ignore it. You must fight the fly in its gathering and breeding places. Flies keep away from garbage cans that contain Lysol solution. Flies cannot breed in wall cracks and floor cracks or in dark corners if these places are sprayed or washed with water that contains a little Lysol, for Lysol kills the eggs. Lysol disinfectant. Besides keeping flies away, Lysol also makes the home germ-proof. Its, syst its systematic use kills all germ life in sinks, drains, toilets, and in dark, sunless corners. Use Lysol regularly whenever flies gather or germs can breed, and you will make a better fight against disease than disease can make against you. A little Lysol goes a long way. A 50 cent bottle makes five gallons of powerful disinfectant. A 25 cent bottle makes two gallons. Lysol is also invaluable for personal hygiene, but only an original yellow package. Lysol toilet soap, Lysol shaving cream. Samples mailed free. <clears throat> Interesting. <laughs> Getting 100% out of your income.
Huh. Real boys club in which there are no grown folks, just boys. <laughs> just kind of flipping through at random, looking to see what stands out. A letter from Lady Randolph Churchill. Let's see. Dromedary brand dates. Right. I am not seeing stuff about the flu or about women's suffrage yet. So I'm not going to linger too long in this issue, or this part of the year. A lovely two-page color section for the Christmas issue. Um, it's stuck together a little bit and torn a bit. but. The illustration is to go along with a, uh, a story called Christmas in the Woods by Henry Clayton Hopkins. And there's all these animals just dancing. It's really cute. It's really cute. Super cute, that. Um, okay. Right. Not going to linger. I'm going to move this one aside because I want to look. I want to quickly look at December of 1929 and possibly January of 1930. Do you happen to know why I would be looking at those dates? I'm guessing I'll have to go to January of 1930 to find anything. But curious to see if there's any mention of the stock market crash. I mean, there has to be, right? I do know there's women's suffrage stuff because I've searched it out before. I just don't know exactly which pages it's on. <clears throat> but since they would have published the December issue in November, I'm guessing there won't be any mention of it in the December issue itself. But you can also see there's a lot more color showing up in these issues now. <clears throat> Once we get to the latter part of 1929 here. And the, so the book has gotten smaller. It's, they're not as tall. They're still not as small as a modern magazine size. They're definitely not a digest size. Right, okay. I'm gonna look at January of 1930. <clears throat> Just because. Oof. <laughs> Sorry, they're very heavy. They're big books and they are heavy. Um. I would love to like spend more time with them. <clears throat> and if I was really searching for a specific topic or something, I probably would. Um, but we only have a limited time on stream and I like to show off kind of the variety. As you can see here, um, I don't, 
we haven't been looking that closely, but uh, you like, I like big books and I can't not lie, yeah. Um, it actually has a cover now. I would have to do some digging to find out exactly when it started having a cover, but it actually has a cover <clears throat> instead of, so it's, it's starting to look more like a modern magazine. And, and inside is where you get sort of the same opening that we had before. This one starts off with where prohibition is a success. It has eliminated poverty and made the United States prosperous. Let us consider the state of a nation which in a decade has come into a glory transcending that which any prophet has foretold. It is a new kind of glory having nothing to do with glittering chariots or shining armor or purple robes or trumpeting heralds. It is a glory of the many and not of the few, and it principally concerns those who once were known as the common people, and their wages, manner of living, automobiles, electric apparatus, savings accounts, and other such lowly and material affairs. The glory is somewhat as of conquest, but of a new kind of conquest, for the vanquished thing has been intangible yet very real. The foe has been the world's oldest and best established institution, poverty. The country has developed surely and rapidly to entirely new conceptions of wealth and standards of living. Those who were considered very rich in the old 400 days would today be held as only pretty well fixed. The usual working family of 20 years ago, which felt itself well to do, would feel poor today if it had now only what it had then. The cringing poor have vanished or adopted cringing as a method of earning a living and it is daily becoming more difficult to engage the services of what once was a, f what was once a fixture, the hardworking wife who toiled to support the, a drunken husband. Ah, uh, Lord Portico, I agree. This seems a very ill-timed and confusing, bold claim that prohibition has eliminated poverty and that there are no cringing poor in January of 1930 in the United States. One month. One month after the stock market crash that started the Great Depression. I was not expecting to start the January issue with what is essentially an editorial claiming that everyone is well-to-do one month after the beginning of the Great Depression. I'm somewhat confused by that. And see, on the next page, the very next page, like, the next page, Paper Profits, A Story of Wall Street. True. What, uh, uh, let's see, the stock market crash was December 29th? I need to know what actual date it was. No, it was October 28th, 1929. So, not one month, two months. They had all of November and all of December. I don't know why I had it in my head that it was December 29th, but it's October 28th.
<laughs> so, they have the editorial claiming that everybody's rich. And then the next, the next item is Paper Profits, A Story of Wall Street by Arthur Train, author of Illusion. Life was pleasant in the spring of 1927. In the United States, money was plentiful. Everyone was pr prosperous. Lindy had flown from Mineola to Paris without stopping. One could telephone from New York to London. The Coolidge boom was on. Multitudes played the stock market. A few did not. Among the latter were Lawrence Rand, Esquire, resident of the town of Glendale, Connecticut, fiction editor of The Smart Woman, and his wife, Betty, who with her two young children was at the moment awaiting his return from town upon the 511. For Phyllis and Len, aged seven and five respectively, this going to meet daddy was the high spot of the day, affording their only peep at the exciting outside world of movie posters, electric signs, and drugstore windows known as Central Square where a giant traffic cop sat Buddha-like under an umbrella, and beautiful ladies in resplendent motor cars quite unlike their own likewise gathered at the station platform with their children every afternoon to meet the latter's daddies. Really, what they enjoyed seeing most was the motors, the town's most obvious evidence of prosperity. These, although of every make, were, save in color, all astonishingly alike, and with their gleaming chrome and nickel, even more astonishingly new. Parked at the curb in orderly arrangement, their strident yellows, scarlets, and blues alternating with more sober buffs, grays, and greens, they reminded Betty of the page of national flags in the forefront of the encyclopedia she had recently bought on the installment plan and would take two years to pay for. Uh, Lord Portico, the Prohibition article was an editorial. So not a paid advertisement, just an editorial. Possibly something written a year, a year earlier and sitting in a pile and someone just pushed it to this issue because of current events. That is entirely possible, was not worth it. But in spite of the fact that their little car was a rattling affair, Temperamental in performance, entirely bare of paint in spots, and hopelessly distorted as to mud guards, Betty did not care. External appearances p played little, if any, part in her existence. Larry, who inevitably bought a brought along with him half a dozen manuscripts which he had not had time to read at the office, was usually the last person off the train, and this gave her the better chance to observe what he called the Comédie, the comédie Humaine de of Glendale hail the few whom she recognized and wonder about the others, for there were always strange faces appearing among the regulars to excite her imagination more and more of them now that the Glenmore Club had proved such a success and new houses were going up there every week or two. Tonight she was impatient for the train to come in because the Sam Tinkers, the Joe Craigs, Gerard and Joan Lee and Virginia Saltus were coming to dinner uh, and she was afraid that Maggie, their painfully stupid general girl. What? What a way to refer to a household uh, servant. Uh, would forget to put the chicken in the oven in time. Nine was quite a party. You know, I bet she probably didn't put the chicken in the oven on time out of spite because she was treated so poorly by someone who thought of her as painfully stupid. Every time Larry's salary was raised, Betty vowed she would let Maggie go and get a good couple of uh, who could attend to everything instead of having Pete Carrillo on part-time to do the chores. But there was always something that seemed more important, a new bathroom, an overhaul for the already much overhauled motor, or a, a radio. At the moment, it was the nursery rug, which was worn to a frazzle and a leak in the roof between the children's beds. Only where the money was coming from, she had no idea. So she continued to act as nurse and do much of the housework herself, leaving Maggie and Pete to wrangle over the rest of it between them. There's the train, announced Phyllis, standing up on the back seat. Can I go meet Daddy? And me too, I want to go. Len already had the door half open. 
Come back, dear, ordered Betty, dragging him back beside her. You know I never let you go on the platform. Daddy'll be here in ten seconds. If we got out, he might miss us. A simpler time when humans were cruel and petty. Good to know that in our present era, we no longer require physical paper to communicate our pettiness. Huh, yeah. <laughs> uh, by this time, the train was in, and the more impetuous of the homecomers, who had been standing upon the steps, had already swung off and were hurrying across the platform, intent on getting in their nine holes before dinner. These were followed in more leisurely fashion by the rest of the commuters, among them, peering anxiously through his spectacles, the Reverend Alfred Weatherby, pastor of St. Andrews by the Sea. Full face, he was pink-eyed and rabbity, but he's had a profile like a horse and a habit of saying, Nyes, Nyes, sorry, it's a weird way of saying yes that might somewhat sound like a horse. Uh, in a dying fall, suggestive of a mildly irritating neigh. Uh, Betty respected his sincerity and sympathized with his difficulties, for in spite of being surrounded by the well-to-do, uh, the church was always in debt, and Mr. Weatherby was always worried. Just behind him stalked broad-shouldered Redmond Carey in a blue serge, serge suit, junior member of the inconspicuous, inconspicuous Wall Street firm of Coston Carey & Company, chatting with little Dr. Karachi, a bacteriologist once connected with the Rockefeller Institute. Betty, searching the rear ranks for Larry, heard from just beside her a shrill, terrible, uh, a shrill treble of admiration. Oh, Mom, look the beautiful lady with Daddy! Next minute, Larry, his briefcase bulging with manuscripts, had con convoyed the beautiful lady to the car. Hello, kids. Hello, Betty. This is my wife, Mrs. Shelton. Mrs. Shelton held out her hand with a brilliant smile. How do you do, Mrs. Rand? What a charming little boy and such a sweet little girl. Betty reddened. I'm sorry. Len, Len will say whatever comes into his head. You won't have have to worry if such nice things always come into his head. I hope you'll let me come see you. I'm really confused. I have not paid enough attention to have followed what just happened, but... Nope, I think I followed exactly what just happened and I was still very confused. I do think it was a joke, but the husband got off the train walking with a beautiful woman, walked over and introduced the beautiful woman to his wife and kids as his wife. Anyway, uh, so that's a narrative tale apparently associated with or topically related in some way to Wall Street. Uh, which, honestly, I bet most of the readers of the Ladies' Home Journal prior to the stock market crash didn't really think about Wall Street all that much. Oh, I love bright, bright color ad here for uh, Hidden Hunger Fighters. The juice of an orange, a glass of milk, a dish of sun-browned wheat meat. Hidden hunger is the hunger of the body for minerals, vitamins, and other food elements absolutely needed for health and growth. It is a chief cause of rickets, stunted growth, and other deficiency diseases among children, and of reduced vigor and health among adults. In these three great natural foods, wheat meat, orange juice, milk, science has found the precious food elements that satisfy hidden hunger and promote vigorous health and growth. How fortunate that you can combine them in a breakfast so delicious, so economical, so easily prepared and served. Wheat meat is the original quick cooking cereal. In just two minutes, it's ready for the milk or cream. For babies longer, of course. And from each gold and blue package of Wheatney at your grocer's, you get 12 pounds of delicious, nourishing food at a cost of less than one cent a dish. 
Wheatney is made from the entire sun-browned wheat kernel, therefore contains all the great nourishing materials that nature packs so generously into her choicest grain. Doctors have used and recommended it for half a century. If you have never tried Wheatney, why not have it for breakfast tomorrow? Your entire family will relish its flavor. Special offer to mothers, Feeding the Child from Crib to College was written expressly for mothers by one of the most eminent child specialists in America. It contains vital information on diet, also many attractive recipes, now only 15 cents for an attractively bound copy. Check here and close 15 cents for the book and a Wheatney sample. Check here and close no money for a free sample of Wheatney. Name, address, the Wheatney Corporation. Whoa, 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 whoa. The Wheatney Corporation, Wheatnaville, Rahway, New Jersey. W-H-E-A-T-E-N-A-V-I-L-L-E. -E. And I, I mispronounced it the whole time. It's Wheatena. And the Wheatney Corporation is apparently located at Wheatnaville in Rahway, New Jersey. It reminds me somewhat of Malto Meal. That's the modern product that I'm fami familiar with, uh, which was probably combination competition for Wheatena back in the day, as they say. You can see here, there's a lot of repairs on this page here. There's multiple tears. Um, this was part of the art and architecture collection, and I assume was used as reference for a lot of like, uh, art styles of different eras, things like that. Um, but there's actual like um, paper tape that's been put in here. This is actually better for it as a repair. It, it, it's harder to see through than cellophane tape, but um, this paper tape is a better repair uh, for the tears uh, for like long-term preservation. It's still not ideal. This was definitely not done for preservation purposes. This was just, oh, it's torn, let's repair it. Um, yeah. Anyway, I hope, I hope it hasn't been too scattered freaking company towns. Hey, we did talk about a company town not that long ago um, on stream, but I, I, I'm, we are at time, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch off the document and um, just say, I, I hope this wasn't too scattered. Um, it, I wanted to try and cover the Ladies Home Journal because it was Women's History Month, and I knew we had them, and I find them kind of interesting. Um, I feel like this is one that I might revisit at some point in time after I've had a chance to, like, kind of look through and mark specific things that I want to highlight. Um, just flipping through, it was kind of difficult to locate specific things that were particularly interesting. Um, but hopefully you got a little bit of a sense of like, this is a major magazine. This is a magazine that uh, less than 10 years ago, you could have gone and bought a copy of and it would have had like Oprah Winfrey or Ellen DeGeneres on the cover. Uh, and it would have been a glossy and it would have had tips on dieting and tips on stretching your budget and how to lose weight and, uh, you know, all, all the stuff that is in like a major women's daily or, or not Women's Daily, Women's Interest magazine. Um, so all the things that they want women to think that, that women want. Uh, so it would have had makeup ads and it would have had stuff like that. Um, and we're looking at a hundred years ago. And it was similar, but with different focus because women at the time that these were printed were mostly in the home, running the household, had domestic help, uh, we're caring for the children. Um, so while some of the topics were similar, some of them weren't. Uh, and yeah, I, I find it really fascinating um, to look at some of these old publications and things like that uh, and just 
behind us, see what there is, um, we may actually end up doing something similar next week. Um, I have another women's magazine that is thankfully in a smaller form factor um, that we may look at next week. I haven't fully decided what I'm going to pull for next week. Um, with some of the uh, education legislation that has been passing around the country, I'm tempted to go and we have a an LGBTQ focused magazine um, that would be interesting to share on stream. Uh, but I may hold off and save that for April. But I also may just do it next week. So we'll, we'll have something. I will be back in a week's time with something from the archives to share with you. Uh, whether it be another women's magazine um, from the late 19th century. Uh, I have a name for you. I can share the name of it with you. Um, if I open the right application on my phone. Program schedule. Because I have it in here. Oh, Godey's Ladies Book uh, is what it's called. Um, I, I may, I probably will do this one next week. Uh, Godey's Ladies Book, alternatively known as Godey's Magazine and Ladies Book, was an American women's magazine that was published in Philadelphia from 1830 to 1878. It was the most widely circulated magazine in the period before the Civil War. Its circulation rose from 70,000 in the 1840s to 150,000 in 1860. Uh, in the 1860s, Godey's considered itself the queen of monthlies. So I have a feeling we're going to do Godey's. Oh, Wheatonville appears to be a sponsored radio program. Interesting. Um, so I think we're going to do Godey's Ladies Book next week. I would really, really love to highlight um, a women's magazine uh, from the early 20th, late 19th century that focused on um, the interests of black women. There were magazines. We don't have any copies of them, so I can't focus on them. Uh, but I really wish that we did have issues of them. I would love to share those. Based on the nickname of their plant in Rahway, New Jersey. That makes sense. But yeah, so I think we'll do Godey's Ladies Book uh, next week. And then in April... So in April, we celebrate Pride Week here at Virginia Tech. So I tend to try and do like LGBT stuff during April because it coincides with events happening on campus. Um, there is a magazine that we have issues of that would be interesting to share uh, called, I believe, I, th I think it's QED. I, my brain is going to be completely wrong. Uh, I'm sure those are the wrong letters. <laughs> but anyway, I, we'll have an LGBT magazine that we look at um, later in the year. I should wrap up the stream. Um, thank you all so, so much for stopping by and joining me as we looked at the Ladies Home Journal today. Um, I hope it was fun for you. It was interesting for me. Uh, I was even if a little scattered as we jumped through year after year. Uh, looking for any reference to the major events of the day. Um, like I said, I will be back next week with content from the 19th century. Uh, Godey's Ladies Book is likely what I'm going to stream next week, which will jump us back another hundred years. <coughs> um, oh, Abyssal, <laughs> welcome. I am so sorry that you're getting here right, at, at, right as the stream is ending. Um, uh, let me go ahead and set up a raid. And then I'm gonna drink some water because, <coughs> boy, water. I, you know, we're gonna go over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium because we always do. Uh, they do some lovely chill afternoon st streaming. Uh, so if you need something on in the background, um, they are great. Um, oh yeah, time changes are probably coming up soon. I don't actually know exactly when that happens, but gen generally March. Um, so, 
so uh, I don't know exactly when, but yeah. Uh, so yeah, we're going to head over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. I hope that you enjoy some uh, sea life related content over there, and I hope that I see you again next week. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for coming by. I really enjoy having you here. Um, <laughs> so uh, I hope I see you again soon. Until then, bye.